the world is changing. The demographics of our society are changing. Science is exploding in terms of knowledge at such a very fast pace. So I think that recognizing all the different determinants of health from the genes to the social determinants of health, behavioral aspects of health, I think recognizing all those things was the, the impetus to changing the curriculum. It was called Genes to Society because we recognized that the individual variability had really two large sources. One was the genetic makeup of each person and the second was the accumulated environmental experiences of each person. So to do one without the other made no sense at all. So it was more dull as I got closer to the spleen and then more dull here as I got Typically in medical school the way we taught the students was in generalities and uh, average patient or what medicine often called the classic case. And then when you actually got in the trenches and started seeing one patient after another, you realized, well, this patient is sort of like the classic case, but it differs in this way, and this patient is sort of like the classic case, but differs in that way. Uh, geneticists would always say, well, actually, there is no such thing as a classic case. Uh, every patient is different. So we thought, with the tremendous advances in genetics and genomics, and the ability to enumerate the genetic differences between people, shouldn't we be teaching students from the beginning that everyone is different? We sought to revolutionize that with the new curriculum here at Hopkins and meld genomics, the practice of medicine, its disease states and preventative medicine, as well as the societal factors that, that affect outcomes for our patients. You really have to think about everything that's going to affect their ability to, to get healthy. And I think it was a great way to learn medicine because every time you go through each of the different systems, you're not just learning about here's the anatomy, here's the physiology and the pathophysiology, but you're actually learning everything from how their diet affects their care to how certain new policies are going to affect it. So you're really thinking about the big picture. One is appreciating those differences. The second aspect of it is learning how to use that information to improve the health of your patient, either in preventing the onset of a particular disease or if the disease has occurred, sort of thinking about the differences in prognosis and response to treatment and so forth so that you could individualize your instructions to and your treatment of your patients, uh, taking advantage of their variation and avoiding pitfalls that their variation might present. To the developing world, uh, this what becomes one of the big problems of trying to make these programs work. Uh, this is what happens when you don't... Get in the old days, the medicine was taught in a more siloed fashion, looking at disease as both abnormal and normal. It's pretty much, you know, your first year you do all of the physiology, normal physiology of the human body. And then the second year, you spend that year doing all the pathophysiology and pathology and learning about all the various diseases that can go wrong with those, with the organ systems. And then what the, the new curriculum strives to do is integrate that right into every organ system, whereas we had that all kind of spread out over a bunch of different courses, over a bunch of years. Genes of Society is more systems-based, so we did everything once. So when we did the lungs, we learned the normal at the beginning, then we learned the abnormal, and we learned the pharmacology, all at the same time, all one test. Um, so it's, it's definitely more streamlined. It's also pass-fail, which is really nice. In the previous sort of old curricula, uh, they got a lot of basic science at a time when they didn't really uh, see all of the relevance to clinical medicine. Genes of Society really has changed that dramatically. Uh, the students see patients right from the beginning and I think they, they get the connection. They started with us trying to already get us introduced to the patient sooner. Well, I saw my first patient on day three and I thought that was pretty incredible because some of, of my friends at other medical schools didn't see patients for months. And then we built in these intercessions between blocks of time and all four years in the first two years, the intercessions focus on clinical topics. For example, learning about health disparities or end-of-life care or global health. And these are things that very much affect all of us as physicians. In the second two years, the intercessions focus on basic science. The scientific education that they receive is enormously important. And I think we all think that this is something that separates Johns Hopkins from many other places that one could get a medical education. And we didn't want to sacrifice on that. On the other hand, we did want to spread it out so that they were more receptive to it uh, and they heard it at different stages so perhaps more likely to carry it forward with them uh, uh, over those uh, over the su subsequent decades of their career. 
problem with those kinds of cancers is that they're really tough to treat because if you imagine like a tumor with really thick stromal tissue, it's kind of hard to penetrate. Today's but students are different from students 30 years ago or 25 years ago. They're, they learn in different ways and so we're constantly in Gene Society exploring new ways to train our students. Previously we all sat in lectures for you know hour after hour after hour now they can hear their, they can sit in the lectures, they can hear their lectures online, they can do six different things while they're listening to the lecture, they can listen to the lectures at 2x speed on their computer. And you know, lecture is probably about half the time in the first years and then small group is the other half of the time with your afternoons mostly free except when you have clinical skills, um, which is very hands-on and fun. But you, you know, the small group work is it's very interactive, it's case-based, it's just a great variety and kept you, keeps you kind of intellectually engaged throughout the day. Increase the computerized learning tools that are now available, increase uh, simulations, um, emphasizing patient safety and, and cross-cutting themes like professionalism uh, across the uh, four years. We want prospective students understand that we recognize that they're different from students 25 and 30 years ago, even if they don't know what those differences are. We know what they are and that we're willing to change to adapt what we teach and how we teach to the people that we teach. Yeah, you probably want to go a little bit deeper. You want, this is your subject area. I think you go to a place to train at any at any stage, and and frankly, to teach and do research and take care of patients also, because of the people that are there. Faculty are incredible. They're famous. I had Carol Greeter as a small group. You know, she's a small group leader in my first year, and won the Nobel Prize. I mean. And then the next week was back, you know, teaching the small group. I, I absolutely love our class. I think the class of Met 13 is amazing. Um, we kind of went through GTS together. And I think at the end of the day, it's our classmates that they're the ones who really inspire us. They are Peace Corps volunteers. They have prized fellowships that they've participated in. They are extremely bright. And we all feel like we probably wouldn't hold a candle to them if we were trying to apply at this time. If you're fortunate enough to get in here and come here, you are going to see the best and they're going to expect you, you know, to live up to that name, but you're given the best opportunities, the best faculty. If you're an applicant to a Johns Hopkins program and you want to say, okay, fine, it's a great place to train, I, I hear the environment is wonderful and people are supportive and everybody is great when you're there, but how do people really do? Take a look at where, at what people are doing when they're out of here. I mean, they are, they are becoming leaders in medicine and biomedical science all over the world. I do solemnly swear, solemnly swear, by that which I hold most sacred, by that which I hold most sacred, that I will be fully committed to those I serve. Changing a medical curriculum is really a big deal. It's like turning a gigantic oil tanker. It, it really is hard. There's so many people involved. We're fortunate enough to attract a very uh, top-notch medical student. So they're excellent when they walk in the door. So it's not good enough to say that when they leave they're excellent because they were excellent when they came in. We have to show that what we've given them is something that will allow them to uh, take advantage of their talents, their enormous talents, and improve medicine over the next four generations.